If you have a Bible, open it to 2 Thessalonians. If you need help finding it, it's right after 1 Thessalonians. How about that, all right? If you don't have a Bible, there should be one under the chair in front of you or in the row. We have a couple out that you can use. I preach from the New King James Version, so if you want to read along from that, those Bibles are from the New King James Version. If you have an app on your phone, turn off Facebook and uh, Solitaire. You can look at your phone and look at, the, look, at, look at 2 Thessalonians. I preach from New King James Version if you want to use that. There's also some sermon notepads back there if you want to take some notes and learn about the uh, context of what we're talking about this morning. But this morning we're starting a new sermon series, a new sermon series, and uh, it's from 2 Thessalonians, and I've titled this series, Look Unto Jesus, Look Unto Jesus, and Miss Ashley Ammons did a great job of putting together the graphics for us, and so she has uh, put it together for us, I sent it out on social media, and uh, we are going to look unto Jesus during this sermon series, and I think you will be greatly encouraged by this letter. Uh, this letter is a great, great encouragement. Many times as Christians, we find ourselves, we find ourselves weary in this world. We find ourselves discouraged. We sometimes find ourselves angry. Sometimes we find ourselves bewildered. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed, like I can't take it anymore. Sometimes we feel disappointed. And as believers, sometimes this world rakes us over the coals, so to speak, and we want to respond. Sometimes we respond by calling out on God and asking for judgment and vengeance and saying, Lord, it's time. Why can't you uh, deliver and uh, bring judgment to these people in this wicked world and their ways? But when we find ourselves in any of those conditions... We need to look unto Jesus. That's what we can control. We must look unto Jesus. And what I mean by that is we have to turn our hearts. We have to turn our focus. We have to turn our trust upwards. We cannot look to this world to be encouraged or to keep on living for God. We must look unto Jesus. It is said that you must take the high road. As a Christian, you must take the Jesus road, all right? It's not just the right thing, it's the Jesus thing. It's the Jesus road. And I found myself this uh, year and several prior years interested in the Women's Softball College World Series. Anybody ever watch that? It's a great time, especially if you're a Gator fan, because the college girls Gator team usually is pretty good, but uh, they haven't been recently so well. But there has been one team that has been exceptionally well. And if you know this team, when I say boomer, you're going to yell sooner, all right? Anybody know what team this is? The Oklahoma Sooners, right? So the last three years, they've won the championship every year. Three years in a row. They did a three-peat. It's been dominated by it, and they've won three years in a row. And I was just interested in watching the team play. And then afterwards, they did these interviews, and three ladies uh, shared about their journey and shared about their championship, which I thought was incredible. Maybe some of you have already seen this over social media, but I wanted to share it with you this morning because I thought this is a perfect way to start our series on getting our eyes up and looking unto Jesus. So I want to share this video with you, and I'm going to come back. Alex Garber with ESPN. For, for the players, I know you talk about keeping the joy of the game, but I'm curious. It's a long season, right? And you guys have had the target on your back the entire time, the win streak being number one. How do you handle the unique pressure that comes with that? How do you keep the joy for so long when anxiety seems like a thing that could very easily set in? Well, the only way that you can have a joy that doesn't fade away is from the Lord. And any other type of joy is actually happiness that comes from circumstances, and outcomes. Um, I think Coach has said this before, but joy from the Lord is really the only thing that can keep you motivated, um, uh, just in a good mindset, uh, no matter the outcomes. Thankfully, we've had a lot of success this year, but if it was the other way around, uh, joy from the Lord is the only thing that can keep you embracing those memories, moments, friendships, and all of that. So uh, I would, that's really the only, the only answer to that, because there's no other way that softball can bring you that, um, because of how much failure comes in it and just how much of a roller coaster the game can be. 1,000% agree with Grace Lyons. Um, I went through that my freshman year. I 
I was so happy to win the college. I've talked about this before, but I was just so happy that we won the College World Series, but I didn't feel joy. I didn't have, I didn't know what to do the next day. I didn't know what to do for that following week. I didn't feel filled, and I had to find Christ in that. And I think that is what makes our team so strong is that we're not afraid to lose because if it's not the end of the world if we do lose. Yes, obviously we worked our butts off to be here and we want to win, but it's not the end of the world because our life is in Christ and that's all that matters. Yeah, um, I think a huge thing that we've really just latched onto is eyes up. And you guys see us doing this and pointing up, but we're really like fixing our eyes on Christ. And that's something where, like they were saying, you can't find a fulfillment in an outcome, whether it's good or bad. And um, I think that's why we're so steady in what we do and, and our love for each other and our love for the game, because we know this game is giving us the opportunity to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think once we figured that out and that was our purpose and everyone was all in with that, um, it's really changed so much for us. And I mean, I know myself, I, I've seen so much of a growth in myself with um, once I turned to Jesus and I realized how he had changed my outlook on life, not just softball, but understanding how much I have to live for, and that's living to exemplify the kingdom. And I think that brings so much freedom. And I'm sure everyone's story is similar, but we all have those great testimonies that have really like shown how awesome it is to play for something bigger. Um, and I think that's just what brings me so much joy. And no matter the outcome, whether we get a trophy in the end or not, we're, this isn't our home, and I think that's what's amazing about it is we have so much more. We have an eternity of joy with our Father, and I'm so excited about that. And, yes, I live in the moment, but I know this isn't my home, and um, no matter what, my sisters in Christ will be there with me in the end um, when we're with our, our King. So. Wow, what a, what a testimony, right? I mean... Uh... Makes you want to say boomer sooner, right? Doesn't that give you hope, though? Hope to see a generation that gets it. Three ladies who have climbed the pinnacle of their sports career. Anybody who's ever played sports, been a part of sports, know uh, that the greatest high is to win that championship. And then still in that moment to know this world still falls short, that there is something more to live for, something that's beyond this world. And I thought they did a great job of talking about their motto of eyes up. Whether good or bad, at the end of the day, they're going to be with their king, with Christ. And they're going to be with uh, one another. And, and that's what it's all about. That's what this letter is all about. This letter that Paul writes to, to, uh, to this church at Thessalonica. He tells them to get their eyes up, to look unto Jesus. This world will have ups, it will have downs. And, and as a matter of fact, worldly speaking, as a Christian, you're going to have more downs than ups. I know you're not going to read that on the bestseller look for Christian books, but I'm going to tell you it's the truth. And, and if you have downs, does that give us an excuse to not to serve Jesus faithfully? To not to serve Jesus well because you've had some tough times or you've gone through some rough patches? No, we don't get a free pass. We must be faithful, good or bad. And we know this world is not our home. We know in this world the wicked will prosper. We know we have a real enemy in the devil. And he's not dressed up in a little red suit with a pitchfork. He is real. He is an enemy. And we know we will be attacked. And we know there will be wickedness. And we know that there will be those who turn from God and hate God and hate the things of God and the people of God. And you say, well, how do we make it? Well, we, how do we keep from getting angry and how do we keep from taking vengeance and how do we keep from getting discouraged? How do we keep from losing our joy? We have to look unto Jesus. That's the key. We got to get our eyes up. We can't, we can't focus on every little thing. Our hope is in the coming king. That is what's going to set the wrong things right. That is what we're going to focus on in our eternity. That's what really makes all the difference in the world. And listen, I get it. I'm just like you. I'm just like everyone else I talk to. We're tired and sick and tired of this world shoving down wickedness down our throats, right? I mean, we're tired of our kids being attacked. We're tired of our kids being taught all these different things, and it's coming after our kids younger and younger. And culturally, it is anti-Christ and anti-the Bible and anti-God, and it's doing all these things, and maybe you've become angry, or maybe you've become weary, or maybe you've just become discouraged we got to get our eyes up. That's what Paul's telling them. 
Paul says we must look unto Jesus. Let's live life with our eyes up. Let's live life with the kingdom of God in view. And when you see Christ for who He is and where we're going to be with Him one day, all the world begins to fade away. And that's my prayer. That's my hope. That's my desire in my heart for myself for this sermon series. And I pray you'll come along with me in this journey. I pray that you will pray to the Lord to say, God, whatever it takes, get my eyes up. Let me get my eyes under Jesus and let me discover all that Jesus has in store for me. And when you do, like Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he said, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know what he's saying there? That accounting term says, I have looked at all the liabilities of this world and I've looked at all the future glory in God. And he says, it's not even a comparison that the future glory far, far outweighs any suffering of this present time that you could ever imagine. It's not even close. He also tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I loved what she said about that. Yes, at the end of the day, you might be able to raise a trophy of this world, but it's nothing compared to being in the kingdom of God. It is nothing, good or bad. This moment, this, uh, this momentary time that we have, there is an eternal weight of glory that we must look to. And as you go on this journey, as I go on this journey through 2 Thessalonians, I hope we get our eyes up. I hope we look unto Jesus. And that is my prayer for you and for me through this whole series. And so as we begin this series, let's talk about series, let's talk about context. Context is king. My seminary professor taught me this. He said, if you're gonna be a student of the Bible, you have to know context. Context is the date the author, the audience, and the culture and purpose in which the letter was written. All scripture is profitable to all believers. I believe all the way from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, you can be those scriptures are profitable to you and to me to this day. All the way through the whole thing. But what how we apply those scriptures has to be set into context. Let me give you an example. When I was a single in the singles class and I met Erin for the first time, I quoted to her 1 Thessalonians 5.26. I said, greet the holy brethren with a kiss, right? <laughs> she responded with, touch not the Lord's anointed. All right, that's what she responded with. But bad verse out of context, right? Who can use that verse? You can say, greet the brother with a holy kiss, and it has nothing to do with that. And so what I'm saying is we take scripture and we twist it to mean what we mean. When you set it in context, it means what God wants it to mean. And we apply it to our lives in these ways. And so we must know the author, the date, the audience. And so as we take a few minutes to study through this context, I hope you'll follow along with me. So first, I mean, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2, the first two verses. I want to read uh, the first two verses. It says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy... To the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I want you to notice the city. Thessalonians was written to the group of believers that was in Thessalonica. That was a city located on the northern Algean Sea. It was a city under Roman rule, so that's where they were under the Greek Roman rule. But they were established as a free city. They had their own agenda. They had their own government. It was a very prosperous city. It was located on a major highway of trade and route travel. And there was a lot of travelers and a lot of people coming and going. It was considered the hub of Macedonia, which would have been a large portion of this, uh, of this country. It was the center of the political and economical activity. Kind of like a New York City or a Washington, D.C. in our country. The population was around 200,000 people at the time of this writing. Now, the earthly writer was the Apostle Paul. He immediately says that in the very beginning, and he wrote a letter, an epistle. When you hear the word epistle, that just means a letter. In fact, 27 books in the New Testament, 
21 of them are epistles. Some general epistles and then the Pauline epistles, which are 13 letters. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Philemon, Galatians, Philippians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Ephesians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and Titus. All those letters written by Paul uh, to churches. This one was the second letter to the church at Thessalonica. Paul also mentions two others in this in this verse that is with him, Silvanus and Timothy. Silvanus was Silas in Acts. You guys remember Silas, Paul and Silas? Uh, Silvanus was his, uh, was his Greek name. And so Timothy was also a young pastor, a young believer. Silvanus would have been about the age of Paul. Timothy would have been much younger. And so Timothy and Silvanus or Silas was taking time with Timothy to train him up. And so Paul encountered the city on his second missionary journey. For those that have been here on Wednesday nights, we covered this in Acts chapter 16 through 18. Paul left Philippi. He traveled about a thousand, I mean a hundred miles up to Thessalonica. And as, as the custom of Paul was, he would go into the synagogue. The synagogue was where the Jewish teachings would happen. He went in there and started preaching the gospel. It says he would take the Old Testament and he would preach Christ unto them. And as he began to preach Christ unto them, they were getting angry. And they thought Paul was a, uh, you know, a heretic. And so they would get together and kick him out of the temple. And so as he went out of the temple, he would go to the outer courts or the outer area and begin to preach to the Gentiles or to the Greeks. And as he would preach to the Greeks, some of them were converted. And here in this city, there was four people that was mentioned in the book of Acts that were converted. Jason in, the book, in Acts 17, Gaius in Acts 19, Aristarchus in Acts 20, and Segundus in Acts 20. So there was four Greek people who had come to know Christ through teaching of Paul here in Thessalonica. And because of the hostility and the persecution of Paul, now in the community, they would drive him out of the city and Paul would leave that city and go to another city. And that's exactly what he did. As he left Thessalonica, he traveled. And as he left, the church was left to these new believers. And so we have four mentioned, but I'm sure there were many more. And they were called out believers in Jesus Christ. So when he says this letter is to the church at Thessalonica or the Thessalonian church, he is talking about born-again believers in Jesus Christ. So the audience is believers. The audience is those who have trusted in Christ and believers in Jesus Christ. That's what a church is, believers in Christ that have come together. And then Paul met back up with Timothy and Silas or Silvanus in the city of Corinth. He was there for about 18 months. And immediately when he got there, he received a great report about the church at Thessalonica. And he wrote a letter to them and he bragged them up. I mean, he was like the crazy grandpa that was telling all the good things, right? If you ever want to hear something, uh, go to a grandfather and watch him talk about his grandchildren, right? Or a grandmother, just bragging everything about him and telling him all the good things about him. And he bragged him up in a good report. And that's what First Thessalonians is. We studied that about four years ago. And I know you guys remember that study, right? So we didn't get the Second Thessalonians, but that's why we're picking it up now. And so the second letter comes after he gets a report. That the church was growing and doing well, but it was under severe persecution. It was under persecution from the enemy, from the culture, and from those who were around them began to persecute them. And false teachers had infiltrated the church, and they began to sow doubts about the coming of Christ, and sow doubts about their faith in Christ. And so Paul wrote this letter. He wrote this letter to address three main issues. Three issues. He, he wrote this letter because they were discouraged. He wrote this letter to talk about deception of false teachers. And he wrote this letter because they were disobedient to divine commands. He had already taught them truth and they were choosing not to obey the truth. And if you love hard work and you believe in every man working for his dollar, you're going to love 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. All right, I'll just go ahead and give you a spoiler alert. Great chapter. But Paul writes this letter and he addresses these three issues. And that's where I'm going to camp out for the rest of this morning, our time together. I want to, I want to talk about how Paul uh, dealt with these other believers. And we're going to set the stage for the rest of the letter. And Paul has incredible wisdom. 
He was a missionary, but he was a shepherd at his heart. He was really a pastor of pastors. He, he really loved people and cared people, and Paul was someone who knew how to disciple people. And you say, what are you talking about, disciple people? He was, he was one who could move people along in their walk with Christ. He was someone who would come alongside of someone and push them or lead them to be more like Jesus Christ. And Paul, above everything else, was a disciple who made disciples. And what I love about Paul is from his, his early life, after he was converted to Christ, to the day that he died, he never lost his mission. There's not a time when you read of Paul's life where he slipped for a couple years, or he got off track for a few years, or he chased a few rabbits. No, he was on mission for the Lord his whole life. After he had come to know Christ, he had given all that he has to make disciples. And what a, what a challenge for you, and what a challenge for me. What a challenge for our church. Listen, we exist to make disciples. We want to be disciples who make disciples. That's what our mission is. And that should be the heartbeat of our church. And everything we must do must fulfill that mission. God has commissioned us as the body of Christ to make disciples. And that's what makes the church different than anything else. Listen, you can gather at a social club, you can gather at a, you know, any other sort of gathering and, and socially or educationally, but what sets the church apart is that it wants to make disciples. That is the purpose of why we gather. That is the purpose of why we do this. I believe I'm called to make disciples, and God has gifted me as a pastor to make disciples. God has called you as a Christian to this church to help make disciples it is all hands on deck that is what our mission is as a christian and especially if you're a parent this is a great mission for you as well god has given you your children so that you can make disciples that's what you are to be pouring into their life when you get to the end of of raising your child and you set them out into the world they should be set out as a disciple of jesus christ they should be prepared to live a life well-pleasing to the Lord. If you're a part of this church, the process of you leaving and coming to this church should be one of making disciples. And if anyone has ever been a part of making disciples, you know it's hard work. That's why it says make disciples. It doesn't just happen. You have to be intentional. And what happens is sometimes disciples get stuck. Sometimes disciples get discouraged. Sometimes disciples need other people to come alongside of them and push them along to help them move closer to Christ. And that's where a disciple maker comes in. And that's why it's important to be a part of a church, of a body of believers, so that other believers can come alongside of you and push you along a little bit to help you get closer to Christ and to help you become more like Christ when you are struggling. And so Paul's instructions to the disciples here at Thessalonica, I want you to learn from that. I want to learn from that. I want to address these three issues and identify the wisdom that Paul gives us of how we are to respond to these three issues. And I want you to think about it in two ways. I want you to think of about you as a disciple and then you as a disciple maker. So this as it applies to you as a disciple, and this as it applies to you as a disciple maker. So first issue I mentioned was discouragement. Discouragement had come to them because of persecution. And they were opposed by this uh, group of people, and they had become discouraged. What did Paul do in chapter 1 to those who were discouraged? You know what he did? He comforted them. That's what he did. He comforted them. Listen, what happens in the kingdom of God uh, on earth here is that when we move forward the kingdom of God, we are met with opposition. That's just the way that it is. It is you are advancing a line for the kingdom of God and Satan is pushing back. He is going to persecute you. He is going to set trials into your life. He is going to bring his full arsenal against you when you begin to advance the kingdom of God. If you don't believe that, you start advancing the kingdom of God and watch what happens in your life. If you start to pray, everything in the world will begin to happen in your home, right? Listen, when I used to go out on visitation early on when we had, uh, had begun visitation, 
Every time I would get to the most important part to talk about the gospel, the dog would bark or the phone would ring or something crazy would happen. And it was nothing but persecution or trials because it didn't want that, that Satan does not want us to advance the kingdom of God. He opposes the work of the Lord. And he brings the world, he brings false teachings, he brings false converts, he brings all sorts of disappointments in your life. And through that onslaught of attacks, we get discouraged. We get discouraged. And, and you know what discouraged is, or the true definition of discouraged? It means that you lose the courage to do the right thing. That's what discouragement is. Discouragement comes and says, I know what I should do as a godly husband, but I lack the courage to do it. It is as a parent that you, should, that you lack courage to do the right thing as a parent. You have gotten to a point to where you have given up and you have lost the courage to take a stand or to do the right thing. And discouragement is so common. It is so common, and it is one of the biggest tools of the devil. It is something that once it starts in a family or a church and it spreads to a couple of people, it literally, it spreads like wildfire. And maybe you are feeling discouraged this morning. It happens to all of us. Listen, I get discouraged. Discouragement rings my number every single day. Sometimes I answer the phone, sometimes I don't, right? And listen, it comes. And it comes in different ways. As a pastor, it comes through people a lot of times. I was listening to a pastor, and he says, I love being a pastor. I just don't like the people. <laughs> All right, listen, that's, that's kind of like an accountant saying, I love to be an accountant, but I don't like the numbers, right? Listen, numbers, uh, people, all these things are going to bring you discouragement. And as it, as it comes to your life, it brings you down. It gets you down. It sucks the joy out of you. It takes the purpose out of your life, and it makes you throw your hands up. Let me tell you some things that you say when you're discouraged so that you can identify if you're discouraged or not. You'll say things like, I don't know why I keep doing this. You say things like, I have been doing this for years, and nothing has changed. I have done nothing to deserve this. I don't know how long I can keep doing this you also say something like this the next time I do this if something doesn't change I'm going to quit no one listens to me I am the worst person in the world things will never change or they always happen that way listen when you find yourself saying these things you're discouraged and you might say it about the things of God you might say it about church you might say it about your family you might say it about yourself, and when you get discouraged, what does Paul do to those who have discouragement in his life, in their life? He comforts them. He comforts them. Listen, this is so important, not as just as a disciple, but as a disciple maker. When you have someone who's discouraged and they are lacking courage because of persecution and trials in their life for doing the right thing, they don't need someone to come along and yell at them. They don't need someone to come on and pile on like the friends with Job. You remember that story? Job had his friends and they said, oh, you're going through all these trials and tribulations because you're a bad person. That's why. You've done something wrong in your life and you deserve this punishment. Or maybe it's like the other friend that comes on and says, maybe it's your wife or maybe it's your family or maybe it's some of those things. Listen, when you're discouraged and you are persecuted, you don't need to be yelled at or we don't need to yell at people or tell them just to pull up their bootstraps. No, we need to comfort them. You know what comfort means? The word literally means to give strength to. It means to offer hope for someone. Listen, when you offer hope and you give strength to someone else, you encourage them, you build them up. Listen, when someone's discouraged by persecution and trials, you, you don't tear them down, you build them up. And the Christian life is tough enough. And for us as Christians, we should be one another's biggest encouragers. When someone is fighting for their, for, for their family and someone is going through their life and they're having all this pressure put on them, we should build them up and help carry the load. We should come alongside of them and encourage them and give them strength and give them hope. And listen, as you as a disciple maker, are you one who piles on or are you one, are you one who encourages someone? 
Are you one when people see you that go the other way because they know you're just going to discourage them even more? When someone encounters you at a church, at church or the community or in, in, in your family, are they torn down when they leave or are they built up when they leave? Listen, as a great disciple maker, if you're going to learn to be a good disciple maker, you need to encourage or comfort those who are discouraged. Listen, as parents, this is important for our kids too. Listen, I have kids, I have three of them, all different, all three of them deal with things different ways. And they've all had struggles and they have all had trials. Listen, the, the, just because I'm a pastor and they're pastor's kids doesn't mean that the troubles and trials and persecution doesn't float by our house and we don't get touched by them. Listen, we're touched by them just like everyone else is. And each one of them I have learned in my life to tell them just to suck it up or to push on or keep trying harder or I don't call them a loser or try or whatever else you want to say. That's not the way to encourage When people are down and they're discouraged, you need to bring comfort to them. You need to bring strength to them. You need to bring hope to their life to say, hey, you got this. You got to be encouraging. You got to build them up. Listen, discouragement needs to be met with comfort. And when you have that comfort, it changes the whole situation. So discouragement was problem number one. Problem number two was deception. They were deceived by false doctrine. What does Paul do? Chapter 2, he instructed them. He gave them the truth. Listen, for us as Christians and for us as disciples, we're going to be deceived. The devil is the great deceiver. He deceived Adam. He deceived Eve. He's deceived many others. He's deceived you. He's deceived me. And listen, sometimes we get deceived. Sometimes we don't, we're not firmly rooted in God's word and in the truth, and we fall for false teachings. Listen, this is important. Because for us as Christians, sometimes we just go along with the crowd. And we hear things, and we, we pick things up, and we never check them with God's Word. That's why I always tell you, if I say something from God's Word and it doesn't sit right with you, go home and look for it yourself in the Bible to see what it says for the, in the Word yourself, and especially in our day and time today. COVID was great to put everybody else on YouTube and podcast and all sorts of different things. And you can listen to messages and Christians and pastors from throughout the world. And listen, there are a lot of good preachers and a lot of good teachers. But let me tell you, not all of them are good preachers and not all of them are good teachers. Several times you will be listening to something or hearing something and there's some false doctrine in there and false teachings in there. And if you don't, and when you're watching something or listening to something, usually your mind is in park and you're not studying the word, you're not paying attention to the word. And next thing you know, you're believing some crazy teachings and crazy things about the Bible. And all of a sudden you're in ground where, where the devil loves to work. And listen, this area we're going to talk about in chapter two, it's fertile ground for the devil. Because when you talk about the coming of Christ, when you talk about the end times, when you talk about the lawless one, and you talk about the, you talk about the, uh, you know, the, the lawless one or, the, or the, the, the devil who's going to come and those who are the antichrist and the false church, and you start talking about all those things, there is so much false teaching out there and so much deception out there. I'll never forget, years ago. Back in 1998, there was a famous author. He was on every radio station you could imagine throughout all of, the, all of America and most of the world. And he got to a point in his life where he found out the Lord had revealed to him that the coming of Christ was going to be in 1998, all right? And so he wrote a book, and he, wrote, he titled the book, 98 reasons why Jesus was coming back in 1998. He had a sequel to that book, by the way. You know why? Because Jesus didn't come in 1998. You know what the next book was? 99 reasons why he was coming back in 1999, all right? And listen, even after he wrote those two books and even after before he died, people still flocked to his ministry and supported his ministry, and it was a false teaching. The Bible says no one knows the day, nor the time, nor the hour. And listen, there is, it's fertile ground. And so you know what you need? You need truth. And it's no accident that the modern church in America is struggling right now. You know why? Because it's not rooted in God's Word. Listen, we are more concerned with entertainment. We're more concerned with a, a value of, of feeling good or our feelings. And we don't want the truth. 
We want our ears tickled and we want to feel good. Listen, a disciple who wants to feel good or be entertained is easily deceived. Easily deceived. And listen, it happens to all of us and it's blinded by God's word. A good disciple maker will teach truth. It will, it will share truth. It will instruct them. It will teach the word of God. That's why here in our church, I love to preach through the books of the Bible because it is through the Bible and God's word. That's where the power is. That's where the knowledge is. That's where the wisdom is. That's why in our kids' ministry, guess what we teach? We teach the Bible. We teach the old teachings. We teach the, the, the books of the Bible in the Old Testament the New Testament. We want to pour into them God's word before they get out into the world and are deceived. By the way, this is why you can pray for VBS. VBS is so important because we have VBS coming up in a week. And in, during VBS, we take, it's a concentrated time where we take the Word of God and we just pour into their lives. We pour into their minds. We teach them the Scriptures. And they learn the Scriptures and they learn about the Gospel. And it sets a tone for them for throughout the rest of the year to have God's Word richly dwelling in their hearts. So pray for the teachers. Pray for God's Word. Pray for the children that they will receive God's Word. And listen, in your life as a disciple, do you know the truth? You don't have to be a biblical scholar, but listen, you should be listening to scripture and studying the word that when you hear something that doesn't make sense, your, your bell goes off and says, wait a minute, where is that at in the Bible? And let me study the Bible and know the Bible. Then when was the last time you as a disciple maker had a Bible study with someone? When was the last time you sit down with your family and studied the Bible? When was the last time you shared a verse with someone at your, as a co-worker? Or when was the last time from someone from this church you said, hey, let's meet up and have coffee and talk about the Bible. Let's learn God's word together. Listen, when someone's deceived, we must instruct with the word of God. That is the, that is the key. And, and so when someone's discouraged, we need to comfort them. Someone's deceived, we need to instruct them in God's word. Third, third one, disobedience. They were disobedient and would not work. God had given them clear commands about working and fulfilling their duty in the Lord, and Paul had to correct them. Listen, when someone is disobedient to God's word, they must be corrected. And I know this is a dirty word because nobody likes it anymore. It's called accountability. It's called someone holding you accountable. It's called someone saying you shouldn't do that as a Christian. And sometimes we, are, we find ourselves doing things we know we shouldn't do. And it takes someone sometimes to come alongside of us and say, listen, you should not act that way or do those things. Listen, we are sheep and we are going to wander and we are saved. And yes, we are in the process of being sanctified even in my own life. I still struggle with things, and I'm on my way and being sanctified, but there are things that I find myself doing that I know I shouldn't do. And many times in our life, we need someone to come along and say, stop doing that. You shouldn't be that way. You shouldn't do those things because you're willfully being disobedient to what you know is truth. And we need someone to hold us accountable. We shouldn't just let it slide or accept it. When it's willful, disobedient, we need someone to correct us. By the way, as parents... This is your job, too. It's a great thing for you to hold your children accountable. Listen, did you know there are kids who literally make it to school with never being corrected in their home? And the first correction they get is from a teacher? And no wonder why they hate teachers, right? And then, not only on top of that, sometimes the only correction or only authority they have in their life is a police officer. And so once they get to a police officer and they hold them accountable for their actions, they hate police officers. You know why? Because in the home, the parents never held them responsible. He, they never held them accountable. Listen, we, we need to show grace. We need to show mercy, but we must not forfeit, forfeit the truth. If someone is not doing right and they're willfully disobedient to God, they need correction. I need correction in my life. You need correction in your life as a disciple. And as we are a good disciple maker, there's going to be times when you need to tell the hard truth to someone. Hey, you shouldn't be treating your family like that. Hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You know that's wrong. That's part of being accountable. And Paul was a great disciple maker because he corrected willful disobedience. And that's in chapter 3. Listen, we're going to go on this journey. 
And as I close this message this morning, I want to talk about it all together. Paul's heart was that these believers at Thessalonica would finish to the end. That they, they would not be discouraged from persecution, but God would, that he would comfort them and lift them up. That they would not lack the courage to do the right thing. That even if they were the only one to stand, that Paul would encourage them, keep doing it. You are on track. And then he didn't want the believers to be received. He taught them the word of God. And he taught them about the second coming of Christ. And he taught them about the advantage of knowing uh, Christ and the truth. And he instructed them in the things of the Lord. And he also called out willful disobedience. And he will correct them in chapter 3. And so the believers were discouraged, deceived, and disobedient. And their eyes was not on Jesus, but this world. That's what will happen to you. But Paul comes along and he comforts them, he instructs them, and he corrects them. All with the purpose of them being in fellowship with God and their eyes on Jesus Christ. And he wanted them to live unspotted from this world. And he wanted them to look unto Jesus. And he wanted them to look unto Jesus until Jesus calls us home. That's what, he, that's what his desire was. And this morning, I hope, as we begin this journey, as you begin this journey, as I begin this journey, as we begin this journey as a church, would you pray and ask the Lord with me to ask God, comfort me where I need comfort, instruct me where I need instruction, and correct me where I need correction, so that I will fix my eyes on Jesus Christ, and I will not fall for the ways of this world, but I will seek the kingdom of God until I look to his face and until I see the kingdom of God. And oh, what a day that will be when I see Jesus face to face. Could that be your prayer this morning? I hope that's your prayer, and I hope as we begin this series that you would open your heart to the Lord for him to work in your heart that way. So this morning, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come before you, Lord. And God, I do pray, as we consider these verses this morning, Lord, just these two verses. If someone's here and they realize, you know what, I've never called on the name of Jesus. That's the first thing you need to do is call upon the name of the Lord. You need to be saved. You need to believe in Jesus Christ. And this morning, maybe God has uh, knocked on the door of your heart. And this morning you might say, you know what, I do need Jesus Christ in my life. The Bible says, for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This morning you can lift your voice to the Lord and your heart and say, Jesus, save me. I believe in you. I know you have paid the price for my sins and I believe that I trust that. And this morning the Bible says you can become born again. Or maybe you're a Christian here this morning and you are discouraged. You're a parent or you're, a, you're married or you're single or maybe you're a church member, or maybe you just came here for the first time, and you say, you know what, I'm just lacking courage to do the right thing. I'm just ready to give up. I'm ready to throw in the towel. As in, I pray this morning, you'll just say, Lord, here I am. Comfort my heart this morning. Or maybe you're here this morning, and you realize you've fallen for some dece deception. Maybe some false teaching, or maybe something that, maybe you believe that everything in your life was supposed to be healthy, wealthy, and wise as a Christian. And you've had troubles and trials and you're wrestling with God about how you're having these trials in your life. And is he a good God or is he not a good God? Maybe this morning you'll just get rooted in God's word and say, Lord, instruct me in your truth. Let me know what the Bible says about that so my heart can be fixed on you. Or maybe you're here this morning and maybe, maybe through the process of living and going through this life, you've been, you're just willfully disobedient. You know what to do, but you're just not doing it. You willfully are choosing not to be obedient to the Lord. And maybe it's through serving, or maybe it's through your family, or maybe it's through something else in your life where you're saying, I know God wants me to do this, but I'm willfully being disobedient. Maybe, maybe this morning you'll just lift your heart to the Lord and say, God, here's my heart. I'm going to change. I'm willfully disobedient, but I don't want to be disobedient anymore. Lord, correct my heart. Turn, change my ways so that I might get my eyes fixed on you. And this morning, as we pray, as I pray, so just say, Lord, help me fix my eyes on you this morning. And I pray that for you. I pray that for my own life. We're going to have a few minutes. We're going to play a song here this morning just for two to two and a half minutes. If you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed and just open your heart to the Lord and say, here's my heart, Lord. It is open. Comfort me. Guide me. Correct me. 
Whatever it may be, Lord, do a work in my heart this morning so when I leave this place, my eyes will be up and I'll be focused and fixed on Jesus Christ this morning.